Well, in many ways, aside from Arizona State winning, it was kind of status quo in the Pac-12. That doesn't make it uninteresting, though. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another reaction episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view post-college football viewing. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights and soon to be mostly team-free. But until then, beloved and loaded conference of champions, like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review. Please and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which is brought to you by prize picks go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college use code locked on college for first deposit match up to 100 dollars. daily fantasy sports made easy status quo a kind of as in i mostly predicted the outcome of every game uh, correctly this week doesn't make it uninteresting one thing i've talked about with washington over the last few weeks is there has been a national narrative around the Huskies, and it's reflected in them not being in the top four of the college football playoff, even though they obviously should be over Florida State. And hopefully they will be after beating Utah 35 to 28. I think what impresses me with the Huskies is they have a way in which they play at their best, but they don't have to be playing in that style of football. They don't have to always be that version of themselves in order to win. And I think great teams are capable of winning in more than one way. A great starting pitcher doesn't have one pitch. He's got three or four. And I think Washington has got a couple pitches more than people would like to give them credit for. Now, defensive concerns are going to be raised. And I do think that is valid. They played well in the second half, 100%, which is what I'm talking about. Defense isn't having its best day, but you find a way to win the football game. Shouldn't give up 28 points to Bryson Barnes at home. That was not a great look for the Husky defense. The adjustments were very good. I think that Washington defense is okay. It's not USC bad, but it's not great either. It's not, I don't think, as good as Utah's defense, which was going up, of course, against a great offense, which is what makes Washington so dangerous. Michael Penix, 332 yards and a couple touchdowns. Dylan Johnson is really starting to come into his own as a runner. This is what makes Washington such a good football team. Kalen DeBoer is really good situationally. And when the game is close, Kalen DeBoer is really good. And we know Kyle Whittingham is really good. And Kalen DeBoer just outdueled him. And I look at this Washington team and say, they just keep winning football games. That's been status quo for them. It's just, you know, win, win, win. I think that's 17 wins in a row. They don't all look the same, but they all end the same. And it's Washington winning the football game. Now, Utah showed that they too are a good team. And I think Utah at Arizona next week is going to be the best low stakes game in the Pac-12, maybe in the country, maybe in the country, because neither team will make the Pac-12 championship game. Arizona needs far too many things to happen that aren't going to transpire. And I guess technically they could, well, let's see, USC's got three conference losses now. They have the head-to-head -head with Oregon State. So if Oregon State were to beat Oregon, I yeah, yeah okay, maybe, maybe it's there. I, I haven't mapped all of that out, but more likely than not, Arizona won't be there. But Utah proved that they are a good team, that, that they are a really good team. And I think it's a bummer for Utes fans because coming into the year, my biggest question for Utah, I asked one about every single team, and it was, well, Cam Rising, you know, be healthy and play. Because if you tell me that Cam Rising isn't there, they're not a Pac-12 contender. And that's the unfortunate reality. You look at this game and go, yeah, if Cam Rising's there, they probably win. But he's not. Just like Oregon State had to make do with Ben Goldbranson a year ago. It's the reality of the situation. If it were differently, you could have a different, or if it were different, you could have a different result. It could play out differently. Unfortunately for the Utes, it is not. Because if Utah goes into that game with Cam Rising, I think they win the football game. And if Cam Rising is playing, they probably win at Oregon State too, or at least have a better chance to do so, and they're contending for a college football playoff spot. Like, they, they heck, 
We saw Dylan Gabriel make a 49-point difference against Texas this year. The Oregon game could have been different. Everything could have been different. Because outside of quarterback, Utah is really, really good. And it's not that Bryson Barnes is bad. You know, 17-30, 267 yards, two touchdowns, and two interceptions. Washington's run defense, by the way, was really good. That's why they won the football game. That's what we talked about earlier in the week here on the show as to you know what Washington had to do to win the game. It was slow down the Utah rushing attack. Well, here's what Josh Pate would call a padlock stat. Utah runs for less than 120 yards, under four and a half yards of carry. Yep, if you told me that before the game, I'd say Washington wins. And guess what? They did win the football game. USC, on the other hand, here's a weird thing to say about a Lincoln Riley team. I believe this is the first time he's ever endured this as a head coach in college football. He's lost four times in his last five games. Now, I thought this would happen. USC made it close at the end. Oregon was in control throughout the game. But USC, to their credit, kept fighting. Their defense played much better than I thought it would. No Alex Grinch, and there's improvement. Oh, my goodness. What a concept. Who could have foreseen that the guy we all knew, except Lincoln Riley, was a problem for the last several years, being removed from the equation would make things at least marginally better. It wasn't a good start for USC defensively. Bo Nix was 2 of 2 for 161 yards and two touchdowns to begin the game. That's a true stat that existed once upon a time. Bo Nix still threw for over 400 yards, but Oregon only ended up with 36 points. Not a lot of people, myself included, had Oregon being held under 40 for just the second time this, or just the third time this year, and just the second time in conference play. They'd been rolling through a lot of people. USC's defense played better. It's too little, too late, though. And Caleb Williams still plays really hard. I mean, every play, that guy, that guy is so good. Like, he is, he, you, you can have the perfect defense called, you can be well coached. You can be sound in your assignments, and Caleb Williams can still make a play. He had in he had a sequence against Oregon where the Ducks were rushing four, dropping seven in coverage, and everybody is covered up. I mean, the check down is taken away. Like, nothing's there for Caleb Williams. So the pressure comes, and the rush lanes were adhered to by the defensive line. And then Caleb Williams just kept getting away from guys and then had this little dump off pass to a halfback for eight yards. Every other quarterback in college football, pretty much, that's either an incompletion or a sack. And with Caleb Williams, it was an eight yard gain. The guy is ridiculously good. But yeah, status quo there for USC. They kept on losing and they couldn't play good enough defense to win the football game. Washington kept on winning. Utah was competitive but did not win. Oregon State blew out Stanford. Arizona found a way to win. Arizona took a page out of Washington's book. I'll explain more in in just a moment. But Arizona State pulls the stunner, and I mean stunner, of the weekend, really, in all of college football. They go into the Rose Bowl, and Kenny Dillingham's team, not capable of playing in a bowl game, Arizona State, Beat UCLA at home. Now, the Bruins did not have their top two quarterbacks. That doesn't help. Oh, wait. Arizona State was also on a third string quarterback because to begin the year, it was going to be Drew Pine. He got hurt. Then it was Jaden Rashada. Then they're back to Trenton Borgay, the former walk on. And he walks into the Rose Bowl and beats Chip Kelly. Does that put the Bruins head coach on the hot seat? What an interesting question that is. I'm going to answer that. I don't have the answer that you probably think. Now, the answer to the question, should you check out prize picks, is yes, because it's the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. The easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports is just you against the numbers. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including pros and sharks, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you'll watch the winnings roll in. With basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports. So, for example, you could do LeBron James and Travis Kelsey at 10 and a half combined three-pointers and receptions 
and decide whether you want to go over or under. All sorts of fun props like that. You can also play against some of Prize Picks favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz in the community tab. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use code locked on college for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Little second segment set makes the show easier. It's after 1.30 in the morning when I'm recording this, by the way, because I'm a nut job. So Chip Kelly is six and four this year. I predicted them to end the year seven and five. Six and six is on the table, by the way. Their next two opponents are USC and Cal. Cal, who plays Stanford this week, who we all know is not very good, and Cal, who beat Washington State and is suddenly inspired to play for a bowl game. Now, the talk of Chip Kelly being on the hot seat is going to intensify. That is understandable. I can, on the one hand, think that chatter along those lines is warranted and also think that he should not be fired. Why? Well, when you're down to your third string quarterback, there is an element of leeway provided. Should Chip Kelly have lost that game? Nope. I do not think so. What I also know and think is that when Chip Kelly took over UCLA, it was a mess. They didn't even have 85 scholarship players. They were a three and nine team in his first year. Then they were four and eight the next year. Then they got a little bit better and they kept getting a little bit better. And they came into the season with expectations that I had tempered down and I have been proven right about the Bruins all season long. And so They are sitting here at six and four. They'll play in a bowl game and they are going into the Big Ten next year, a conference that at the top is better than the Pac-12, even this version of the Pac-12, because you have, you know, some of the top teams, Oregon, Washington, USC, and then you add in Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. Now, the bottom and middle of the conference is not good in the Big Ten. It's a lot of (laughs) it's ugly football out there. They don't know how to score. They can play defense, but they can't score. And I think once they play some good Pac-12 offenses or former Pac-12 offenses, those sorts of teams like Iowa are going to struggle mightily. So when I look at Chip Kelly and say, okay, what's his body of work been? Number one, he has reset the standard because at one point in time, if he'd gone six and six, it would have been yippee ki yay. This is fantastic. What a great day. So I look at a guy that has done that. And for me personally, I don't know how the administration is going to view it. But I did not expect them to actually be a Pac 12 contender this year. Some people, Josh Pate included, who I'm a fan of, said, I think they're going to the Pac 12 championship game. I listened to that take and I said, that's utterly ridiculous. They don't have the quarterback play to get there. Well, fact check, I was correct. So when I look at the Bruins, compared to what my preseason expectations were, this is kind of how I thought it would go. I always felt this was a mistimed rebuild year for UCLA. Because if this defense had been there a season ago, UCLA plays for a Pac-12 championship. I think they beat USC last year. I don't know if they beat Oregon, but they are certainly more competitive in that football game, and they do not lose to Arizona. Instead of a 9-3 and season, I think they would have been at least 10-2, and maybe 11-1. and But they lost Dorian Thompson-Robinson and are having a reset at the most important position. And Dante Moore is going to be UCLA's quarterback in 2024 and beyond unless he decides he wants to transfer elsewhere. I don't know that he's going to do that. He's going to play in the Big Ten. He's from Detroit, so he'd get to play a lot of schools close to his hometown. His family can go and all that sort of good stuff. So I anticipate him to stay there. We'll see. We will see how that ends up playing out. That could change the calculus. But for a young quarterback who has struggled mightily in his first year of college football, who has immense talent and a lot of potential, I don't want to move on from an offensive head coach who just developed, by the way, a raw quarterback prospect that was turnover prone and disastrous at times as a young player, Dorian Thompson Robinson, who Chip Kelly showed he is capable of coaching into an all-conference caliber quarterback. That is what DTR became 
by the time he left college. I know he had a fifth year, but even his fourth year, he had improved dramatically. So Chip Kelly is not the same guy that he was at Oregon in the 2010s. That is 100% true. It's also true that he knows what he's doing offensively. I know they had a bad game, but Colin Schley was not someone that Chip Kelly brought in to be the starting quarterback for this offense. And when you have a young quarterback who is talented like Dante Moore, I am a fan of keeping continuity with him unless it is an abject disaster. And though the expectations, depending on who you are as a UCLA fan, are falling short or the the season's falling short of expectations for some UCLA fans out there and for some media pundits out there. And there were people like Joel Klatt, for instance, who said, look out for UCLA as a playoff team. And I said, "Mm, no, you know, again, again, shut it down. But anyway, you know, next time they should just give me a call and give my opinion. And that's okay. Um, I'd be happy to answer your phone, Joel. Anyway, so I look at this UCLA team and say, look, you should not lose to Arizona State. It's a bad loss. 100% it is. But the program is not in disarray. They're going to a bowl game this year. What bowl game? It's probably not a great one. It's still a bowl game. And the fact that when he took it over, it was a sub-500 program, and he's built it to a point in which you see going to a bowl game as no longer a baseline standard of success, that to me indicates he still has some capabilities as a coach and should be given one more season. Now, this season is going to fall short of what they are capable of, and they won't hit their ceiling again for the second year in a row. But there are still enough encouraging signs to me, encouraging signs to me, going to the Big Ten. Do you want to try and work in a new coach in that conference? I don't know if the administration would do that. I don't think you want to have a different offensive voice talking to Dante Moore. And here's the question you always have to answer for people who jump to, well, fire the coach. Who are you hiring? Who are you hiring? Chip Kelly is not a big time high school recruiter. Are you going to find a better one? Because Chip Kelly's had a lot of success in the portal. Got a lot of good players in the transfer portal. That's his method of talent acquisition in the modern world of college football. It's a valid one. But he was able to recruit Dante Moore. And he's able to bring in J. Michael Sturdivant from the portal and Carson Steele and all the guys who are making big contributions. The ceiling is maybe not what Bruin fans want. But right now, you have to think about what the floor is. Because for UCLA... They've been the number two football program in the city for a long time. Let's see what happens against USC. If Chip Kelly goes out and wins that game, eh, the calls for him to be fired would probably tamp, be tamped down. But I think right now, he he is certainly, he's he's got a warm seat. I don't think it should be a hot seat uh, just yet. So, by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that First of all, in my range of outcomes earlier this week, I did I did see a world in which ASU could win. I did not predict it to happen. I'm sorry for doubting you, Arizona State Sun Devils fans out there. But Arizona State has got their head coach. And Stanford has got their head coach. In seasons like these, the first for coaches that are taking over programs that require a full rebuild and are in complete and utter disarray. Stanford was having an identity crisis and they weren't recruiting well. Arizona State's recruiting was an abomination, being in the 100s nationally, and the results were not good on the field. You are looking for moments that show your fan base, hey, we might have something here. Did This could happen. This is possible. I can see a world in which success happens. That's that's this sort of win for for Kenny Dillingham and Arizona State. ASU did not out-talent UCLA. They had less talent. They out-coached UCLA. Chip Kelly admitted admitted as much after the game, told his players, hey, we, we didn't have you ready to go. Yeah, but Kenny Dillingham did. And Kenny Dillingham's defense coordinator, Brian Ward, continues to be the best hire of the offseason. Washington State's defense. Really bad right now. Gave up 42 points to Cal. Not great, Bob. Not great. I don't even remember what that's from, but I use that line all the time. Brian Ward was a really good hire by Kenny Dillingham, and he proved it again. He proved it once again. And Kenny Dillingham is showing once again that his passion, his energy on the recruiting trail, 
in post-practice media sessions, post-game press conferences, and the way he coaches his team, I think they've got the right guy down there in Tempe. And Troy Taylor, low profile, but has clearly got some coaching chops. Got the right guy, it appears, in Palo Alto. Those two, those two are not going to make bowl games. They don't have great teams, but they've shown me enough to make me think, yeah, I can see them having success. There's still work to be done, but I can absolutely see it. A couple more things from Saturday. We got to talk about Oregon State. I'm going to save the rant for Monday's show because I got to let that fester because I'm pretty, pretty ticked off about that. It's time for our Athletic Brewing Company game-changing play of the week. Much like Athletic Brewing Company has changed the non-alcoholic beer game by making non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good, Washington's offense, once again, changing the game with Michael Penix at the helm. He makes some ridiculously accurate throws down the field, sometimes even whilst under duress, and it doesn't bother him. And it doesn't bother you or me or anybody else that Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic beers beat out great tasting and award-winning full-strength beers in global competitions because they themselves are great tasting and award-winning. They brew over 50 styles of craft, non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, Goldens, Sours, and more. And they're fit for all times. That's the best thing about them. When you're watching a big game, you can have it. Tastes great. Watching your kid's game, nothing wrong with that tackling work working out any time i could have one while i'm doing a podcast here no hangovers ever you can find athletic brewing company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you or buy online at athleticbrewing.com first time customers can use code locked on to get 15 percent off your first online order that's code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n at checkout for 15 percent off at athleticbrewing.com athletic brewing company fit for all times near beer exclusions and conditions apply All right, a couple thoughts. First of all, Arizona. I mentioned this earlier and forgot to get back to it until now. Takes a page out of Washington's book. You know what good teams do? They just find a way to win. You know what bad teams don't do? Find a way to win. I see a lot of teams in college football across the country at all levels. FBS, FCS, group of five, non-group of five, like whatever. Really good teams find a way to win. Texas is a really good team. I don't know if they're a dominant team. In fact, I know that they're not. Georgia's a dominant team. But Texas is a really good team. Why? Because they don't have to play their best to win. They just find ways to win. They just make it work. And Arizona is in a is in an, a, a time as a program in which they are on the rise. They are in the top 25 and they go on the road and are the only thing holding me back from a perfect week of the Pac-12 prime picks, but that's okay. I forgive them. Because the build that Jed Fish has done continues to be impressive, and they're going to get a real test of it next week against Arizona or next week against Utah, back at home in Arizona, where they've already beaten two ranked teams this season. UCLA at the time was ranked. Oregon State was ranked number 11. So, I think what Arizona continues to do is so impressive. I thought they'd win by more. I thought their defense would play a little bit better. I had Arizona 30 or 28, 17 final score, 34, 31 game winning field goal by Tyler loop to end the game up in Boulder. The buffs have lost six of their last seven games. That hot start sure has faded. It's almost like the trenches matter, but Colorado fans didn't want to hear that a couple months ago. That's okay. The chickens always come home to roost eventually. Colorado will eventually be fine once they, you know, build an offensive and defensive line, really an offensive line, and if they get Shador Sanders back. But impressive win there by Arizona. Colorado, not a complete and utter disaster, certainly not great, but they can be tough on their home field. Oregon State learned that last week. USC learned it many weeks ago. Nebraska certainly learned it many, many weeks ago. That's a good solid win for Arizona. Five and two in Pac-12 play at seven and three. Hmm. Two games left in their season. I predicted them to go seven and five. I bet you they go eight and four. That'd be my guess. Be my guess. So I'm going to end today talking about Oregon State, and then I'm going to lead Monday show talking about Oregon State. 
this is why I didn't put this game in the Pac-12 prime picks. I recognize for those watching on YouTube that a light might have just uh, gone out here. And, um, yeah, you're just going to have to deal with it for a little bit. You can still see me. Um, Oregon State obliterated Stanford. When I say obliterated, I mean Damian Martinez ran for three touchdowns in the first quarter, and the final score was 62-17. to Yeah, that was Oregon State sending a message to the rest of the country, one that I'm going to reiterate on Monday's show, which is, All of you in the college football world overlooking us is completely and utterly ridiculous. Now, Washington State was not able to send that message. Again, they've lost six in a row. I've never seen anything like it. I truly haven't. But Oregon State wins 62 to 17. They are, as a friend of mine described to me, a different beast when they're at home. DJ Uyunglele, this is the dream box score for DJU when he transferred in from Clemson. Clemson. 12 of 19, 240 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. And Oregon State runs for 277 yards. Martinez, 9.7 a carry and four scores. Fenwick, 12.2 yards a carry and a touchdown. I mean, that's a really good football team. That's a really good football team. Weird that you can build a football team that's so big in such a small market in a place that's so irrelevant and doesn't matter. I got plenty of thoughts on that on Monday's show, but. Arizona, good solid win. Oregon State did what they needed to do. ESPN didn't do theirs. And that's a shame. And I'll share thoughts on Monday's show. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.